you've got a lot of companies running around saying that they promise that they will give something back, like they had stolen something. The corporate social responsibility agenda is about, we've grabbed it off you, we've wrecked the place, we're doing nicely, now we've got to give something back. Now we can come, if you like, to why that's nonsense. But there is nothing wrong with that old-fashioned conservative view of the world which says, noblesse oblige. Previously, the obligation to do good and to be useful out of great social and affluent and material strength fell to rather few people. But it's my view of mass affluence now that actually we could cheerfully say to almost everybody, you're doing terrifically well to do, to, to be that, to be gracious in the midst of success brings obligations. Now I don't mean that it means giving stuff away. I don't mean that it means being socialist. In fact, I can't really be bothered, and I don't think it's my place, to, to specify to people what they ought to be doing good. But I think it is perfectly reasonable to say to people, you are lucky, stop whinging, enjoy and fold some of this stuff back. Now there is at least one set of persons of whom it is quite unreasonable to expect them to be happy, and it's teenagers. I mean, it is in some sense cruel to say to a teenager, you must stop this gothic affectation of unhappiness, because, um, well, all teenagers, and especially interesting ones, have passed through this phase. But I do think it is fair to say of grown-ups, sorry, it's now time to grow out of this affectation of scowly gloominess. It's, it's, you are now the inheritors of a great society. And what is peculiar, and I admit that it's challenging, but it's not actually that challenging is to make people see that it, in large measure, has been the marketization of society. It has been capitalism that has got us into this happy position. Now, I'm conflicted, but I'm also a fan of the IEA. And I think the little secret about the IEA, which it actually puts right there in its slogan, <coughs> what it says is that... Uh, the IEA discusses and investigates the institutions of free society which produce wealth, something like that. And I think that is the way I read it. I'm not sure that it's the official IEA line, but the way I read that is, is, is very comforting, actually, or ought to be comforting, to those people who dislike the IEA most. Because most people think, I think, that... If you like the market, you don't like government. And I, I'm not, I, I simply don't think that that's true. I think what is, what, what, is, what is beautiful about the Western adventure is not that it had little government in the good old days when capitalism got invented, but that it had good government or beautiful government. Not even that it had democratic government, which, thank goodness, is not necessary to capitalism, since capitalism is going to have to grow and do its good in a world in which democracy may be in short supply and yet capitalism may flourish. But it does seem fair to argue that in these rather wonderful Western societies where capitalism was free to do good, it was free to do good because of brilliant government. Government that, well, one of the things it did, of course, was have the good sense to give people freedom uh, and let them do things that they wanted to do, let them organize together to do things that they wanted to do, to keep the profit of having done so. Uh, after all, if you think of it, capitalism starts to happen. Uh, it looks as though it's happening when Elizabeth and others follow an ancient medieval tradition of giving people the right to do certain trades. 
But actually it really gets going <laughs> when the government stops licensing people to do trade and lets them get on without these inhibitions. So, but nonetheless, nonetheless, the beauty of markets and the beauty of capitalism is that they grow in good societies and are signs of, and where they are happening in bad societies, they're signs of those societies getting better. Not necessarily democratic, but a bit freer and a bit more orderly, a bit more relaxed. And therefore, one of the things we can be saying to children, young people, is there are all kinds of reasons to say you are, you and your parents, you and your grandparents, you, you, you've come out of an incredibly lucky and happy tradition, which it is only fair to remind you, you ought to be grateful for. And that what's more, that tradition in which capitalism was a prime adornment happened because good government allowed capitalism. Capitalism and good government and good society grow together. So the things that you think are good, good government, good society, are the things which produce that other thing which is good, which is capitalism. And you don't have to fear, because it's an absurd but common fear, that there is good society and good government on the one hand, which allows under license this dangerous animal called capitalism, which you have to live in constant fear of. There is no tension between good government, good society and capitalism. In fact, they live together. Even when you're dealing with a free market ideologue, and this is very hard for the average mind to get its brain around, but it's true. Most free market ideologues are even nicer even more worried about the quality of society, and even less actually interested in economics than their more left-wing opponents. The little that I read of, of pure free market thinking, I stumble my way through Hayek, tells me that here is a man who is deeply in love with trying to find out what is a good and happy society? It, when you read him, it's almost incidental that he loves the market, except insofar as the market is, is a quality of, of good society. And yet, when I started drifting towards being a free market person, it was assumed by people all around me that either I had gone over to the enemy, over into the dark side, or, and this is more likely why I actually did it, I thought there was more fun to be had being in something as unpopular as, the, as that box. If we, start to, if we start to explain to people better, in a way in more colourful terms, that the free market and capitalism are indi indi in indissoluble parts of what these great societies are. So you see what I'm saying to you is that we first of all have to remind people that they are happy and living in great societies and that, they, and that those societies are indissolubly linked to the market. But that the market is in no position to take over society. It's a creature of society. It's not an untamed animal. I think the market in our country needs more freedom, not less. But I think so as, as, as somebody who thinks that our markets are unnaturally and dangerously repressed from the point of view of how to create an even more interesting and even more glamorous and even more affluent society that, than we've already got. I said a bit this morning about public space and privatisation. It, it's, an it's an extraordinary idea that there, it, there is something that is the public sphere, the public space, and that we have been taking things out of it. 
the privatisation of water took water out of the public space. If we got rid of the BBC, argument would be taken out of the public space. Um, this, it, it, it's plain if you didn't have the idea of public space, if you didn't have a romance about some socialised public space, you wouldn't need to go out and invent it. The trains, water, argument, the, a newspaper, whether publicly, uh, privately owned or the BBC, state owned, they're, they're, as we consume them and as we live with them, they are just parts of society. We, and yet, there is a divide in our minds, not unlike the divide between the romantic and the rational ab about public space. But it's been, I'm putting it to you that it's been educated into us. And it should be quite easy for another generation, and I suspect our present young don't have, just don't have, some of these hang-ups. I'm very interested, just to finish, in, in the cynicism that is now around. Um, and I suppose it's easy enough understood if you take away the great romances with which we have dazzled ourselves. The religious romance is not readily accessible to lots of people. Um, the superiority of the human species since Darwin is not available to us. Uh, we're not allowed as white people to feel better than black people. We're not even allowed as people to feel superior to animals. I mean, all kinds of comforting fantasies have been stripped away from us. And I suppose to that extent, I rather do feel that young people are, have very few places to shelter. They don't have, and it's my generation's fault, they, they've been robbed even of the right of believing they live in a well-governed country. That has been creeping up as cynicism about democracy, or about democracy as it works, namely politics. And even the Constitution, the British Constitution is one of the most beautiful mysteries that mankind has ever created. But since a generation of idiot teachers have been able to configure it in children's minds as being a set of power relations we've inherited from a dark period, even the great glory of the British Constitution is something we can despise. Politics, Paxman and Humphreys tell us, and all our comedians, tell us to despise. So I suppose it's reasonable that young people should be cynical. I'm not at all sure actually that they are. I've got a feeling that a lot of the problems that I identify are problems that will die out with my generation. The Dylan generation, the Greenpeace generation, that version of romance, that version of perpetual lifelong dissidence will perhaps die with people now my age. But as, you're, I, as, I'm, as I talk to young people, I find myself very interested in trying to, trying to say to them, trying to suggest to them, what it is that it is worth being thankful for in being um, a Westerner. And they are surprised to hear an adult, even an adult as odd as I may seem to them, bother with the enterprise of reminding them that they and I are incredibly lucky. There. Thank you.